Welcome to the Seller Roundtable e-commerce coaching and business strategies with Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. Hey everybody, welcome to a special extra session of the Seller Roundtable. I'm here with my friend Elena Saris and she is going to tell us a little bit about her incredible entrepreneurial journey um, and you guys aren't gonna believe it like when I when I met Elena at um, at the women women's uh, conference empowery women's conference in um, Los Angeles her story was just it just floored me and it was so entertaining and so Elena I'm so happy to have you here welcome I'm glad to be here it's gonna be fun yes definitely so, you know, tell us a little bit about you and your background and a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Well, it's totally the traditional entrepreneurial path. So I started out in law school <laughs> many, many, many years ago, as you could tell by the rotary telephone that is still working. Um, and I was, I was, des I just wanted to, I wanted to be a public defender. That's all I ever wanted to do. I went to law school specifically to be a public defender and 20 some years into that job, I decided I wanted to train lawyers on how to be better lawyers. And so I started making these video series about being a better lawyer because I didn't know anything about online, but I knew it was happening. I knew people were on this thing, you know, the Facebook and all of this was happening. And I thought, well, maybe I'll make some people better lawyers and maybe I'll make a little money. I don't know. I heard people were doing how-to videos on their passion and whatever they were good at. So I started to do this and um, I realized that you're not, you know, if you build it, they will come, doesn't work. So you had to like somehow advertise it. So they said, my friends were like, oh, you have to put it on Facebook. And I'm like, well, Facebook is that place where you stalk your ex and look at pictures of cats. Why would I put a legal <laughs> video on Facebook? And they're like, no, you can advertise on Facebook and it's the perfect age because it's like right when kids would get out of law school. And so I took a class called Facebook Ads Cracked, Don Wilson, shout out about how to do this. And he said, Hey, don't make it theoretical. There's this company called Teespring, uh, you know, use them. They have this merchant processor. You put a t-shirt design up and drive traffic to it. And then you learn how to drive traffic and you can drive traffic to anything. So I did it on a lark and I made like a ridiculous amount of money selling t-shirts. And I was like, Holy cow. There's like, so I was sure I was going to make a lot of money selling these, these videos. And then, you know, for lawyers, but all they did was teach you how to be better. And the rule of thumb online, if you're teaching people to do something, it's how to get paid, get laid, or get skinny. That's it. That's only <laughs> three things people get paid for online, right? They don't want to better their skills unless it has to do with one of those three things that will help them. So um, with my you know, newly found, the minute you, you take any class right, online, you get bombarded with offers of how to make money online. So your first t-shirt, your first t-shirt platform, what was your first t-shirt platform that you used? Teespring. Teespring. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So you were saying? So, so I had a little bit of money. I mean, I literally, one of my t-shirts generated $10,000. Like I called my brother. He lives out of state with his family. I said, if this t-shirt does this, I'm like, will you guys come and we'll rent a house for Christmas and blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. You know, and bam. Um, so I probably, I don't know, I made 30 or 40 grand just, and, but, but, you know, all you did was drive the traffic. They made the t-shirts, then they just sent you a royalty check. It was crazy. But I didn't understand anything about how you couldn't upsell, you didn't have any of your own cuss. I didn't understand it. I just got a check and I was in pig heaven, right? <laughs> uh, then I get this advertisement for, hey, you can sell on Amazon. It's like, how can I sell on Amazon? I'm not Amazon. So of course that was ASM3. And uh, I, oh, I geez, did. What year was that? ASM three. We're on what, like ASM ten now? Ten or twelve, or I, it was around thirteen or fourteen. I think fourteen. Wow. Okay, twenty fourteen sounds sounds about right. That's when FBA was first starting to become like something, <laughs> a so business model. Accessible. Yeah. And I know that there were people that were in like the early ones, um, but for someone who was not tech oriented. Right. They really broke it down. I will give them credit for that. Really broke it down for, hey, you can, you know, do this. And back then it was the Wild West. So I literally put up a supplement and I was number two for a probiotic supplement for a while. And by the way, I didn't even know what probiotics was. Okay. I mean, I just white labeled <laughs> something. And of course I saw the writing on the wall when ASM, the next one opened and 
uh, you know, what, people had to do these giveaway. I got out of that and I just started, I just took a different route from what everyone was saying, which is kind of my bet. Like if you're doing this, I'm gonna go over here and, and try this. So I wound up um, going to China uh, well before China trips were a thing. And I went, I went uh, on this very small unorganized trip and it was hysterical, but we found the, the EWU market. And what I started to do was I started to have a stable of 10, 20, 30 products that were selling three or four hundred dollars, three or four hundred units a month. So I was getting the big sale numbers, but I was diversified over all these different products and they were very cheap to import. So I was testing for like a thousand dollars instead of like four thousand dollars. Right. Right. Um, and I met this fellow, uh, Simon Chan, who was getting into ASM six. And he wound up saying he had his family in China had, um, he was born in the US, but he speaks Cantonese and Mandarin and his family lives in Shanghai and he owned a sourcing company. So we got together and we had, in my opinion, the most amazing China trip because <laughs> you got to go to China and everyone that came home had their own sourcing agent, their own individual person's personal sourcing agent, but it was in the city of Iwu. So yeah. a lot of people were very like, I don't want to sell cheap products and you know, Cheap products, I'm sorry, I know, like when I was a kid, I always tell the story. I knew I had to have a bicycle helmet when I rode. It wasn't the law back then, it was just smart. And I knew that there was like a $100 bicycle helmet out there, but I also knew that uh, most people couldn't afford that. And you know, a $20 bicycle helmet, like you have to offer that group of people something. Right, and, and as long as there's not a thousand other people offering that same product and you have decent margins, and back then, you know, white label back then even these already sourced products on amazon back then heck yeah people were making a ton of money we were making a ton of money it's and it was a little crack. bit it's got a, a little bit tougher now just with all the factories you yeah. couldn't do it and I'll, I'll give you another reason you can't do it and 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 it, you know people associated it with crap which was you know the only the only reason that the people that went to ewa were buying crap is because they didn't have sourcing agents they were just being taken advantage of right and they didn't understand i mean there's a lot of misunderstanding culturally between what the, the Chinese manufacturers are offering us and what we're accepting. Right, um, and in Iwu, you know, you're kind of dealing with, um, I, I had a, translators at Iwu, you had to, you know, it's different than if you're like going to Canton Fair and you're, it's, it's just a different, you're really, you're sourcing things to resell them. That's basically what you're doing, right? And, and imagine you just had probably a translator who was a college student who spoke the language, whereas we had the sourcing agents who spoke English and Mandarin. So we, we had this huge advantage. So we were finding these incredible high quality products. So they weren't, we weren't, you know, but you needed, you needed to stack them up. So what started happening for me in my Amazon journey was we had competition for sure, but I was <clears throat> so entrenched. Amazon, I think a lot of people don't realize this that are coming into the marketplace. Now there's a lot of the gurus out there that are, that are very successful because they've been going for a long time. And Amazon really does give a lot of juice to older stable listings. You know, you really can't discount that. So it wound up being that there was a, there was a sort of smattering in, in the maybe 2016, 17, 18 universe of gurus where they were, sell, they were being very, um, they were full of integrity and trying to tell people how to do it, but what, they, what worked for them didn't work anymore. So it, they didn't know how to translate that into the new environment. So, you know, the new Amazon gurus have to be on top of everything because that environment is changing so fast. Um, so the only re the reason I bring up the, the China trips was when I was, um, when we were doing this, I got a call from this kid and he said, can I come to your China trip? I don't sell on Amazon. And I said, why? And he's like, well, I drop ship uh, from Shopify. And I'm like, well, don't you have to like private label stuff? And if you're just drop shipping, why do you need to get an agent from me? Like my, my agent had no, I would have no idea, for instance, how to get that bird feeder I was selling to an individual customer. They could give me a thousand of them, but they right. would not. So I was like, I don't want to waste your time. And he goes, no, no. And he told me what he did. And he said he had a really good product. So he was looking for an agent to sort of get, you know, to, to take that product into their own warehouse and exclusively deal with him. So he got up on stage and I said, well, you're gonna have to, you know, sing for your supper. I won't charge you to come because you're not using our stuff, but you gotta give us, you know, cause it's really a huge advantage to have someone meet you at the airport, get you through all, right. I mean, that's just a big, you know. So he got up and he starts, his, he brought a friend who was, who was 23 years old and this kid got up and he said he made a million, $8 million on Shopify. And I, I 
pulled him aside and I had talked to him in the hallway and he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. I mean, he was a bright guy, but he wasn't the kind of guy you went like, oh my God, what's wrong, you know? <laughs> no, I, I mean, he was obviously smart, but he was, you know. And he says, yeah, well, you just didn't get that impression, right? Initially, no, like, oh yeah, this guy's going to blow my mind. <laughs> Just saying, but he was 23, so I don't know that I would have gotten that impression. I mean, bless his heart, right? Yeah. But he says to me, I've been doing this for 10 years. And I was like, oh, all right, 10 years. <laughs> since you were 13 years old. He had been hustling since he was 13, some form or another. But when he started showing me these numbers, I thought, wow. Like, wow. And that was, I think that was 2017. And I immediately got home and started a Shopify store. And one of the reasons, like you said, this competition, one of the things that Amazon was doing was they were using my products for their research and development. And now I think it's finally coming to light in like, then I just saw uh, some story in like Business Insider or Forbes where, so I would, I'll, I would be selling like a butter dish, you know, that I would be sourcing for like five or six bucks and selling for like 12 or something, making like two bucks a pop, but you know, selling three or 400 of them a month. Right. And that was one of like 25 different things I was selling. So I was, it, and it was easy. And, and you Very know, sometimes. Scalable. If, you could it, it keep, was, if you could keep finding new products like that, it was, you know, it was the it was old steady. model, right? That's what a lot it, of people did. That was my model. And it was steady. And then sometimes I would go to the ASD trade show and I would find a guy selling the same thing. And I'd say, hey, you know, you probably have better supply channels. <clears throat> so one thing I had was 85 cents. I got it here from China. I sold it for like $12.99. And he had it for $1.25 in a warehouse next to my house. Like, like, so I didn't even have to do China at that point. And it was this, we had the same manufacturer. He was just bringing it in bulk. And then he would just let me have my thousand off the top. It was, it was so perfect for as long as it lasted. Number one rule of online e-commerce, nothing lasts forever. Okay. <laughs> nothing lasts. So always diversify this, this, you know, no plan B, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Have a plan B, C, D, and E, because guess what? The people telling you no plan B aren't making their money selling on Amazon. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so all of a sudden, th that butter dish, uh, somebody would come with the exact same thing in a nicer box, and they were selling it for $7. Like, how are you selling this for $7? And they'd find out it's one of these little Amazon companies. You know, they have these different names that aren't Amazon, like, you know, Cherry Hill that make them sound like a little family and I just, I started going from like, okay, you have 30 of these, you have 20 of these, you have 10 of these. And I was still like, like phasing oh. it out, phasing it out. And I was going to go back to traditional white labeling until I heard this guy talk about Shopify. So I went all in on my first store. I didn't know what I was doing. I did $48,000 worth of revenue my first big month and, you know, come to find out I'd spent $42,000 on ads <laughs> and I lost about six, 16 grand by the time I had to actually send the product to the people who had purchased it from my store. <laughs> so I was not- the Calculations are a little bit different in drop shipping, aren't they? Everything was a little bit different and the money goes pretty, you know, you have to be really on it because you're so excited about getting the sales. Yeah. And the hardest thing in the world to do when you're paying for traffic that you're driving, and you know this like from PPC, you'll get a sale, but the ACOS will be twice the price, you know. And so right. the, 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 the rookie mistake is I don't want to kill it because it made me a sale. I don't want to kill that ad because it made me a sale. Yes. That ad's going to get better. It just need, we just need to give Facebook time to learn. <laughs> yeah, we just had a class earlier. Um, <clears throat> Last this week in our mastermind group, we had a class about profits, you know, and um, we were talking about that. And I was running some numbers for everybody and showing, you know, after you subtract advertising, because of course it's charged separately. So yeah. you don't even think about it as part of your sale. And I'm showing them, you know, after you subtract advertising, you're making sometimes a dollar an hour. If you want to be able to pay yourself, like, sometimes you're not even making money you're actually yeah. losing money by the by the thousands and thousands of dollars and the big thing that isn't being taught is people don't understand how to check their costs of advertising before considering a product right so that's something that we cover but it was really you know that's a really tough thing for people to get and i still get it because i i have to force myself to run my numbers every month and go how am i doing on advertising is this still profitable you know am i optimizing I actually have a guy who I pay a hundred dollars a week to just do a daily sort of overview profit and loss. And then I pay bookkeepers for a, a monthly and 
Yeah, me too. It's totally worth it to me because I'm, I, you know, I went to law school just because there were no math classes. I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I just looked at the agenda and I saw no math. I'm in. <laughs> not, not totally true, but sort of true. So um, you are, so you come back from China and you start this Shopify store and tell us a little bit about kind of your journey learning how to find like drop shipping suppliers, picking your first product on drop shipping. How did that work out for you and how did you learn it? Well, I, I did pick a decent product. I made a mistake uh, in this in this regard. There's there's virality of a, fi a Facebook post. A Facebook post can go viral, like an ad that you place. So I had this really fun product, and I made a cute video, just like a you know a Clipman video. It wasn't like high tech. It was you know a bunch of pictures with animation and words, but it was funny, and so people were were sharing it, and I mistook that for buyer virality. And I, I didn't really understand. That's why I kept, oh, well, if 2,000 people are watching this, then that means one of them's going to, and no, they just thought it was funny. So it wasn't anything they necessarily wanted in their home. So that was, for all the people that might not understand drop shipping, Elena didn't have any inventory. She was hooked up with a product that someone else would fulfill for her if it's yeah. sold. Let and me so back it up, had, yeah. Yeah, so she had spent all this money on advertising, and hadn't sold a product yet. And now you got to look back and you go, oh, wait. So with drop shipping, the good thing is at least you don't spend all your money on advertising and have a bunch of inventory to deal with, but right. you spent a bunch of money on advertising and it didn't convert. So what did you do? Well, it converted, but <clears throat> like if it hadn't had any sales, that would have been great. That would have been easy. Like I'm not that dumb, right? Okay. <laughs> but it had sales. So I kept thinking they were just going to get more and more. So yeah, so basically this is the gist of A to Z drop shipping. You find a product you wanna sell, you go to AliExpress, literally, you find just a listing of a supplier, you look and see if they have a little badge and if they're trustworthy, you check their reviews, their reviews are probably fake, but at least the ones that take the time to make the fake reviews good are good, because uh, there are ones that will just leave, you know, reviews that make no sense. They're not even like, they're not any language. They're just like words, you know, and then the picture is, like, you know, like a picture in a review should be like an amateur picture that you have of something in your home. And it would be like the same exact shot that they took for their head, main shot for their product. And then you, you actually have an automated connection, an API connection from your Shopify store to AliExpress. It's actually connected, okay? It's called Oberlo or Dropified. And then you advertise, you put this up on your store. You write a little product description with the pictures. And then you run ads to the product page, not your store. So everyone's always, oh, I have to build a Shopify store. I got to get my color scheme right. I got it. No one cares. They just go to the product page. And then when they buy from the product page, that shows up as an order in your store. And then at night, you hit a button called fulfill order. <laughs> and that literally takes all of the information that they have typed in. You know, Elena Sarah's 234 Main Street, blah, 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 and it puts it into AliExpress. And it's kind of fun to watch the first couple because it literally opens the AliExpress program on your computer and you actually see the typing of the name and everything coming on automatically. You're just sitting there like this going, what's happening? And then you hit pay now. And you know, eventually when you get a lot of them, you don't even have to do it one at a time. You can just send that supplier a CSV file. Now I haven't vetted the supplier. I haven't vetted the item. I don't know anything about it at this point because I just want to see if it has legs. You know, I don't care if I sell 20 and I wind up refunding all 20 of them because the product wasn't good or the supplier did something wrong, I know now this product has legs. So then I go and I actually vet a real supplier. Like, and now I'm at the point where I actually have an agent where when I find something, I will, I will copy the AliExpress link and I'll send it to him and I'll say, what can you do for me? Now, he's just a guy who knows the manufacturers. He's still going on AliExpress. He just has his, you know, core team of people he trusts and he knows what I want in terms of quality. Yeah. Um, but while he's looking, I'm still advertising to that AliExpress listing. <clears throat> just so that I can see what's going on. And that and that's how the whole process works. So um, I remember I went to a conference two years in a row and the first year they're talking about building the store and I was like, and I had already been selling, but I was like, wow, that seems like a lot of work. Like, you know, and I went the next year, I had done almost 1.5 million in the t time in between. And three of the people that were in the group of five of us hadn't quite figured out the color scheme and the, the, the branding of their store. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me like it's been a year like 
So I, I showed them, um, I had a, a guru that I had hired and he was actually going through something about how this thing was selling and it was, you know, a brand new item that he was doing and it, the product page was really bare and all this. And I happen to know his store and he's doing $20,000 a day in sales. And he's, and he used this store, like, let's say on a Tuesday night on a webinar and it was live and he was showing us the store. Well, I scrolled down to the bottom of his product page and at the bottom of his product page on a live store doing $20,000 a day, it said, Lorem Ipsum, blah, 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 your name here. I mean, so the idea that people care about the color scheme, right? No, this is a, yeah. They're just going to, they, they want that product because they want that, that, product. Ad, that ad that you're running and you're using videos, which I've seen, those are really effective, right? On Facebook, you're using videos on Facebook. And so people are like, oh, that's cool. They're bored, right? They're, they're Let me, can, I, can I share a screen and I'll show you this, like the, yes. the best way to describe it? So I just hit share here, yeah? Yes. And then I usually pick the top okay. left option. Okay. So let me make this a little bit big because this is the world that most of your um, people would understand, right? Right. Okay. So, whoops. So let me go here and let me, why is not letting me, let me back up here. Okay. So Amazon is a world that is dominated. Like Amazon revolves around keywords, right? You, there's, there are, there's a, the main advantage of selling on Amazon over selling on, on Shopify is that there's people there wanting to buy. Like everybody that goes to Amazon wants to buy something, right? My ads are on Facebook. So people aren't necessarily, I mean, it's getting to the point now where you know you're going to get bombarded with ads on Facebook, but you're not there for the intention of buying something. So in order to be successful in Amazon, as you all know, you have to rank high for the keyword that you're looking for. And you have to come up in your head with all the different ways that anyone could possibly describe your blue spatula, right? Blue spatula for cooking, blue spatula for baking, but you know, six inch, but whatever. And that's the whole game. That's the whole game. In Facebook, the whole game is getting someone while you're on your scroll to look at something and say, what the hey, what, what is that? So you talked about videos stopping the scroll. The whole goal is to stop the scroll. Like, what are you talking, what is that? But there's actually a different auction on Facebook. When you place an ad on Facebook, you're actually placing an auction. So there's a different one for images. There's a different one for um, like a slideshow and for a video. So you want all three things to see. So, so here's, a, here's an example. We are, we are the kiosk in the mall, okay? You don't go to the mall to buy a sock at Toomey Sock. You're going to the mall to go to Macy's, to go to the Apple store. And all of a sudden there's like a unicorn sock. You're like, oh my God, I totally want that. Like that has stopped your stroll through the mall. So right. when you're an advertiser on social media, you're the kiosk in the mall. You are not the Apple store, right? When you're on Amazon, you are at the Apple store. <laughs> People are going there to buy that thing. So this is one of the pictures I always point out that made, you know, that was on your newsfeed back in the day. And now people have seen a picture like this, but when this picture first came up on your newsfeed while you're stalking your ex and looking at cat videos and taking pictures of your donuts, which I will maintain to this day, other than currently sharing conspiracy theories and having your high school friend pretend he's a scientist, that is what people do on Facebook. I have decided that is all they do on Facebook. And then this pops up and your reaction is, what the heck? So the idea that someone back in the day, now we, we know now there's something called charcoal toothpaste. Back in the day, how many people do you think type the word charcoal toothpaste into Amazon? Zero to five in a yeah. month, maybe, maybe. Because we didn't know what it was. We didn't have, like if someone sat down and explained it to us, it was great. So if you were an Amazon guru and one of your students said, I want to do charcoal toothpaste, you'll be like, hell no, you're not going to do charcoal toothpaste because if someone, if, if someone put in the word toothpaste and this came up, some black thing, they'd be like, that's gross. I have no idea what it was. So right. someone would have to be searching for charcoal toothpaste and no one was searching for charcoal toothpaste. But this goes on to Facebook and this thing, it had, that had 3 million views in uh, 2018 within the fourth quarter. They did almost 2 million revenue in under two months just with that. So were you running, are, are you simultaneously running a video, a slideshow, and a photo ad? Are you split testing all three? You'll do all three on a good product. Now, right now, I'm currently selling a lot of jewelry. So videos are hard. 
when you do like print on demand or jewelry, and I think, you know, not to test, to test, I'm going to just do an image. And I'll tell you why, because I, I never tell anyone to do anything that takes any time away from getting it up and seeing what happens. Okay. Um, I think I can, I can stop this share here and we can get back to, back to us. So I, I don't want people to be like, oh, I, I want to test this product. And if you want to test a product on Amazon and you have a lot of money, you might be able to test four products a year, you know, if, uh, as a regular person, as a company, you can do a lot, but as a regular person, you're really putting in about three or $4,000. I mean, it minimum, because yeah. you've got to get it. You've got to get it private labeled. You've got to get the package. You've got to pay for it. You've got to get uh, giveaways, you know, all of this stuff. I'm testing five or six products a week and I never spend more than maybe two fifty to four hundred dollars in terms of what I'm going to lose. Because even if a product doesn't work, I'm going to sell some. I mean, you get to the point where, you know, I've no, I haven't put up a product in the last year and a half that hasn't sold any. Right. So you, you're always going to get a few sales coming in. But then you, there's metrics you can go by to say, hey, does this have legs? You know, like if, if your ads are in the eight to ten dollar range and they're doing pretty well and then you put it up to like fifty dollars and it's not doing well. You know, a lot of people can mistake that. They think, oh, if it's, if it's doing well at $10, at $50, I'll do five. No, because your product might not be that popular. It might be good for this little pocket. So the, when I, my, my first month, I told you I bombed. And then I, I came on to something. And I knew it was something that was selling because I buy stuff on Facebook. And it's beautiful because it's my product research. So I actually deduct this from my, you know, I, when you buy things on Facebook, Facebook has you as a good person to show new ads to. So you see ads right when they come on the, the screen. So if I see an ad that has like the first day, like I see it, it's like, oh, it's got like 10 comments, but it's got like 20 shares. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So I'll comment on the ad so that I make sure I get notice, you know, yes, and then I Facebook that too. <laughs> And I you love see studying that other people's advertising and what's working. It's so amazing. And then you find that product on AliExpress. It's easy. You just take the picture. Nine times out of 10, the picture they use is the it's picture the from, from AliExpress. Yeah. You know, right click image search. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for live Q&A and bonus content after the recording at sellerroundtable.com. Sponsored by the ultimate software tool for Amazon sales and growth, SellerSEO.com and AmazingAtHome.com.